All right, I think we're at 1117, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, for our next talk, we've got um, Nate Janis and Jeff Roach, my friends and former colleagues from System One over in Venice Beach. I'd like, like you all to give them a very warm welcome to our first Pi Day to LA. And they'll be presenting 1D convolutional neural networks for time series modeling, so let's kick it off. Thanks for the intro, Neil. Neil actually built some of our uh, uh, data science foundation, our, our modeling architecture. So uh, big, big thanks to him that we use. Um, so we're going to do a two-part talk here. Um, I'm going to do the first part on the, um, on the uh, motivation and the prototyping. And Jeff's going to come up and talk about the productionization and uh, how, we, how we used it and how he built, built out an a API for us with it. Um, I'm Nathan Janos. I'm the chief data officer at System One. I've done a lot of ad tech, and Jeff is a data scientist and has a background in epidemiology, which is cool. So the big idea here is, is there a 1D analog to all the cool two-dimensional convolution stuff that, uh, you know, has been out in the news for the past few years? Um, one of the other sort of overarching themes throughout this presentation is just how uh, Jeff and I worked together to develop this and maybe kind of in a view of the flow that we have at, at our company for developing new models. So deep learning and all, the, all, the, the new wave of uh, uh, neural network architectures are all the rage right now. Um, there's a lot of focus in the, the visual space for classification, obviously. Um, but at System 1, we're more interested in time series modeling. Specifically, we look at things like how do we predict the revenue per click or the cost per click for the next click or the next hour um, for marketing and ad tech type data. So, you know, I was looking, you know, how could we apply some of this deep learning to our problem? And, you know, I came, came across some of the standard literature there. Um, LSTMs, um, recurrent neural networks. Um, these are generally uh, neural networks that have, the neurons have gates and multipliers and thresholds inside of them, and they're, they're uh, set up, chained up in a sequence. And I tried some of that, and I really wanted to see if there was a way to, um, you know, leverage some of these interesting uh, deep uh, neural network uh, techniques, um, but for our problem. So, um, I have a little bit of a background in discrete time and signal processing, and I was wondering, can we combine those techniques with the neural networks and, um, you know, try to, try to go at it that way? Um, you know, these, these discrete time uh, processing techniques have been around for a long time. Um, they're used in all kinds of things like speech processing and um, radar. So why not uh, treat our hourly data samples like one of these signals and see if we can apply these techniques, but you know, with the idea of using neural networks to, to train these filters. So you know, the 2D convolution works well for image classification. Is there a type of 1D convolution um, that works for time series forecasting? So, uh, the convolution that you hear about for uh, uh, deep learning, uh, neural, uh, neural network training, is that you, know, you take a 2D matrix and you apply that kernel, you multiply it on top of an image, and it kind of redu reduces a sample. Um, you know, there's pooling, and um, you, you put together a complicated architecture of these things. And so, I mean, you know, I asked myself, what's the analog in one dimension? And there's actually something that's called a convolution. It's a little bit different than that uh, 2D convolution that's used in a lot of the deep learning. Um, it's a type of integration where you take two functions, you flip one in time, and you integrate it and slide it along. And this is a graphic I took from uh, Wikipedia on sort of uh, how, how that looks. And then here, if you're uh, interested in the, the formulation on the right-hand side, we're going to be using the bottom one there, which is the discrete time. You know, we have discrete samples. We're, we're dealing with our, hourly uh, samples. So the basic architecture we're going to work with here, we have an input signal, the YFT. It's a time series. Uh, we have these hidden layers. Um, each hidden, hidden layer in our network is a convolution layer. So it has an input, and it convolves it with a set of weights. 
So you, you can just think of the input as a vector and the weights as a vector. Um, it outputs that convolution. Uh, it pools it, and in my prototype case, I did all 2x pooling, so if a time signal, uh, time series comes in with length 24, the pool is length 12. Um, we apply the uh, ReLU function on it, and you have another hidden layer. At the end of all this, there's a regression layer. That's you know, our, our, this version of the classification, and all it's trying to do is predict what is the, you know, what's the next uh, value in the time series going to be. So here's an example of, a, this is sort of the picture we'll be working with for the rest of the, um, the talk here. It's a, a parameterized version of this. And so in here, you can specify the way I did the prototype. You can specify any number of layers. In, the, in this case, there's two. And uh, in each layer, there's a number of filters. In this case, uh, there's six across. And the way that I hard-coded it uh, was it if you specify length six, there's going to be six filters going from length one, length two, three, up to length six. And I did that because I know from the DSP sort of world that there are standard uh, convolutional filters that are you know, usually smaller that do things like edge detection. Um, and that's really what I was trying to get at with this for the one-dimensional one case. Um, at the end, there's a regression layer that takes the output from all this and uh, runs a regression on it trying to predict uh, y of t plus 1. So this is just uh, you know, an example of the parameter space. In this uh, previous example, um, counting up all the w's, so all the w's here are all the uh, weights that we're going to learn with, with a neural network. And in that case, uh, there's, there's 66 uh, total parameters there. And so here's just some of the math. There's, there's 30 filter weights. I call those filters. And then there's 36 uh, regression weight parameters. And so there's a total of 66 parameters in that case that you'd want to learn. If you, uh, you know, set the parameters to be 24 filters deep, uh, three, uh, sorry, three, three deep, 24 wide, and running on a, a week of hourly data, there'd be about 1,400 parameters, so a lot more parameters to learn. The parameter space explodes um, as you make these things bigger as you would expect. So um, I had a really complicated slide for this before about how I did the learning, um, but it was, it was too complicated. So what I learned, you know, one of the big things I learned during this, this whole process of trying to look into this novel technique was how hard it is to do the hyperparameter tuning and in particular, you know, picking different sorts of learning, learning rate methods. And the thing that I settled on is this type of uh, gradient descent with restarts. And th the idea here is that the learning rate starts you know, up high, and it, it decreases. And then at some point, you reset it. And decreases again, you reset it. Uh, so this is known as stochastic gradient descent with restarts. What I found in my example with the data that we were working with um, was that we did a lot of restarts. So sometimes you'll see three restarts. I did many, many restarts. I'll show you in a second. And also, when I did those restarts, I didn't restart back up to the initial learning rate. I restarted up to you know, 0.95 times that initial learning rate. So there's an exponential decay. Then you jump back up to a little bit below your original learning rate, exponential decay, and a little bit low. So you're kind of inching down. You're kind of shaking up the system, letting it settle, then reshaking it up. So uh, just to give you a little description of the type of data and, and the testing that we did here, um, we were looking at revenue per click data on uh, mobile devices in an automotive category. Um, we looked at hourly data for uh, nine weeks, 63 days of hourly data. We trained on the first uh, eight weeks of hour hourly data, and then we tested on that last week, sort of the, the out sample. And then we compared the MACE of the model to the mace of a simple model. Um, the simple model being, uh, it turns out that a, a really good prediction for what happens next hour is what happened last hour. So we wanna, we wanna beat that. And so we're aiming for a mace of less than 1.0 in this case, that's, that's good. So this is some actual training data here. Uh, what you see on the top is the learning rate. So that, sort of cyan green, that's the learning rate of our 10,000 iterations um, through, of learning. You can see about every few hundred iterations it resets. 
But the idea here is that it doesn't reset all the way back up to one in this case. It resets a little bit lower. So by the end of this training, you're resetting back up to half of, of what you used to reset up at the beginning. On the bottom here, you see a uh, compar uh, comparison at the same sort of um, iteration intervals, the mean parameter update. So this was a, this is sort of a view that I built into the training process just to kind of see what was going on. Uh, that, that blue sort of jumpy line, that's the mean uh, amount that all the parameters were updated in that iteration. So you can see at the beginning, they're updated quite a bit and they kind of settled down and you see these little pulses of them being updated and those pulses correspond with the learning rate resets. And so what you're doing, there's a lot of learning going on at first, that learning rate goes down almost to zero, then you reset it, and there's another burst of learning, and it goes down and you reset it. And you can see that, you know, by the time we're about halfway through, around, uh, I get 5,000 iterations at this point, there's a, most of the learning is done, and every time you reset it, there's, there's, not, there's not much more in the uh, parameter updates. To me, that validated that the, um, you know, that it was learning and, um, you know, that we were um, able to sort of search out this space effectively. Here's a, a graphic of just, just a sample so you guys can kind of get an idea of the out sample. So the blue is the data um, that we're trying to fit. The red is the model, and you can see just kind of a visual effect there of how well we are doing. You can see, um, like, it's very typical, very strong uh, daily um, periods. So that peak is in the middle of the day. In this case, uh, this is normalized data, but the, the peak is almost four times the, 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 the night. Uh, oh, also, um, in this case, the MACE, the MACE 1 that I'm comparing is 0.85. So, to me, that was already a success. So I'm just trying this crazy thing, just kind of inspired by uh, the, the deep learning stuff, and I see this Mesa 0.85, and um, I, was, I was pretty happy that we got at least to this point. So the, the best results I had in my prototype was working with a network that had six filters wide, so much like that first one you saw, three deep instead of two deep, and a window of 24 hours. Um, and th what we did there is, you know, I, I took a um, 24-hour window and slid it across that entire sample. So from that, you know, eight weeks of data, I, I took 24 hours and slid it along hour by hour and used those as all my training samples. And the best MACE that we got compared to the, uh, the one-hour leg model was about 0.86, which is okay. So uh, I presented this to the team, you know, just some you know, interesting research and, you know, doing some learning for myself. Uh, I realized I should probably use a GPU framework because it was getting kind of slow. I spent, I also had, got a good appreciation for hyperparameter tuning, defining those parameters, def defining the learning rate um, method. And I spent most of my time doing that, actually, which is sort of like the, the meta learning for me. I also realized that I should probably al allow for a little bit more ne network flexibility and that, you know, where I enforce that there's a, in every layer, there's a, uh, arithmetically increasing uh, filters from one to six in this case. Um, I probably would want something more flexible there. And then it'd probably also be a good idea to uh, build this out and establish null network framework um, to better leverage, like, really well-coded back propagation. I rolled all my own um, in MATLAB, so. So uh, Jeff heard this talk and he thought it was cool and he thought he could apply this to actually uh, some business use cases. And so he's gonna talk about how he extended some of those um, conclusions there and then also how he did the, the PyTorch implementation and, and how it compared to uh, another standard model that we use, so Jeff. Yeah, so I was really, really excited to hear about uh, the work that Nathan was working on. It sounded really interesting, different. Uh, and I was also excited about some of the conclusions that he had come to and some of the troubles that he had. Uh, because I was working through the Fast AI course, which uses PyTorch, and a lot of, or those packages accomplish a lot of the uh, problems that Nathan was running into with hand rolling a lot of his stuff. 
So with PyTorch, we could easily integrate it into the GPU. Uh, we could easily test new model frameworks and any sort of expansions that we wanted to do. Uh, it's very Pythonic. Uh, Fast AI, which is essentially a wrapper around the PyTorch framework, allowed us to easily test any kind of hyperparameters that we wanted to, to work on. Uh, and it's already got back propagation built in uh, in an efficient manner, so we didn't have to worry about, again, hand rolling that. So the second goal essentially was to uh, see if there's any kind of improvements we could make on his current uh, architecture. And finally, like having a, an error rate compared to like the, the most recent data point is great, but we also have models that are currently in production, and we wanted to see if we could build something that could beat that. We've tried many times in the past, and it's, it's been really, really difficult. The model that we currently have been using is a, a TBATS model. This is a package that's in R. Uh, essentially, it's a linear time series model that captures really complex uh, seasonal trends. Uh, to kind of give you a graph of, uh, graphic of what it does, the top bar is the observed time series. And the model will essentially decompose it into these seasonal trends, the two on the bottom. The, the season one, which is the third uh, row there, is capturing daily trends. And it's really nice, really sharp, very clear. The second one is capturing that weekly trends. Again, it, you can see like a dip, it seems like on the weekend, uh, there's a different behavior that happens then. And what essentially this model does is you can add these layers up, combine them, and you get back to that observed uh, rate. So this is essentially the model that we're trying to beat. Uh, so after hearing, again, about some of the work that Nathan had done, uh, I had done some additional research trying to dig in to see, is there anybody else who's using these convolutional neural networks in time series? And I stumbled across one paper that was using what's called a WaveNet. They had taken this model structure that was used on audio, applied it to time series, and found that they had some good results from it. Uh, this is the model structure that they were using. They used one filter of length three, two uh, layers deep. This looks pretty close to like what Nathan had done, so this is very, very encouraging to like see that someone else had found some positive results from it. And if we look at Nathan's, it's basically the exact same thing more filters of different lengths. We compared these two models and found that, the one, that Nathan's model performed slightly better. And we think, again, uh, to the point that he raised earlier, it's able to capture some of those more complex edge cases in the time series. So we're going to kind of collapse that back down into like a simple model so I can fit more stuff on this slide. Uh, another technique that Nathan had used is he passed the most recent data point and just bypassed it and went straight down to the regression layer. This helped improve his model performance. And I thought, you know, one point's great, but why not use the full 24-hour window? And also just pass through the intermediate steps all the way down to the bottom. This way we have more features and kind of clicked that, you know, what we're starting to do here is a bit of feature engineering. Um, so this is as far as I could get with this convolutional model. And the data sets that we have at System 1 are uh, highly contextual. Uh, holidays matter a lot because uh, behaviors differ around then. Uh, end of month cycles, quarterly. Uh, we, it would be great if we could include some additional context in this model. So going back to that feature engineering, what we actually did was attach this uh, another neural network from FastAI to create an ensemble model that allowed us to input that context in. So we used FastAI's mixed input model, essentially passed the same 24-hour window along with any context that we wanted to have. This model is a uh, fully connected network that's two layers deep, and you can see it outputs uh, an additional 500 weights down into that regression layer. And we got some big improvements from doing this. So this is the final model that we essentially ended up with. Uh, for those of you that like understand this stuff a little bit better in code, this is kind of the pseudocode for how it's mocked up in uh, PyTorch. Uh, we called this model a filter net. Um, we initialize these uh, convolutional layers. You can see that, let's see if the mouse will show up up there. Perfect. Okay, so we've got these convolution layers that we initialize up here, kernel size one, and we create the first and second of those, and then we continue on with the rest of the kernel sizes below, initialize that context model, and then initialize the, the final linear layer. And that uh, forward propagation function 
which is what's actually doing most of the heavy lifting, you'll pass in that 24-hour window and then any categorical or continuous context variables in. You'll pass that window into that first layer, save out the intermediate, pass that intermediate into the second layer, and then save that out. And you repeat this process for all the filter links that you've got. Stash all those into a, an array. Do the same thing for your context model. And then essentially you combine these two into a final array that you'll pass through that linear layer. So you can see that like in code, this is exactly what we were showing visually is, is going on. So now time for the comparisons. Uh, we ran this TBAS model, which is we use for many of our stuff, and it had a mace of 0.9. So it's doing essentially like 10% better than if we'd used the most recent data point. And it took 30 seconds for this to run, which is pretty quick. Um, Nathan's model, which he hand rolled in MATLAB on a CPU, uh, was outperforming it with that 0.86, but it took 20 minutes for his model to train. This is not ideal for a production environment. So it was great that when we ported it over to PyTorch and put it on a, a GPU that cost us the same amount as on a CPU, uh, that we got the same performance but got a huge uh, speed increase. Uh, cutting it down to almost half the time it took to train this model, which is fantastic. Uh, the filter net, which is that more complex ensemble model, gave us an additional bump in performance uh, at a cost of the uh, training time. But considering that it's still slightly faster than that TBATS model, we were pretty happy with that. So this almost gave us a 10% bump in performance uh, by moving to this other model. So the next step is we wanted to see like, how well this model generalized with something that it hasn't seen before. A lot of times we'll get different traffic sources or partners who come in and say, like, we've got this new thing. We want you to optimize it. It'd be great if we could at least make an a educated guess about how things were going to perform for them right out the gate and to give our models some time to train up. So this comparison, we previously trained on like an automotive category, and then took that training data, and we predicted it on the automotive again, which is what you guys were seeing before. But then we took that same model trained on automotive, predicted it on finance, which it had not seen before, and these were the error rates for that. We can see that both models obviously performed worse, but the filter net uh, still outperformed that TBATS and almost performed, or performed about the same as uh, the TBATS did on the automotive that it was trained on. So in that same lieu of um, not really knowing a whole lot, we kind of wanted to test the limits of, well, how much can it handle missing data points? So I systematically went through this training data and replaced every nth data point with the median, which is typically what we would do if we had some missing data. So for the two step, which we would essentially would fill every other with missing values, so this is half the data is missing. Um, this is pretty bad, and you can see that the models performed also pretty bad and worse than if we just used the most recent data point as it's over one. Um, as you fill in less and less of the data points, both models continue to do better, but the takeaway that I want you guys to have from this slide is that you can see that the filter net uh, percentage difference continues to get worse and worse the more missing values there are, meaning that it's more susceptible to data quality. So the previous data set that we've been using was pretty clean. Uh, we also wanted to kind of test this on a messy data set, one that we've kind of termed as a jagged data set. We've got things com uh, traffic coming in from different sources. Some of them use certain features. Some of them use other ones. They're not all used by the same traffic. So it's important for us to kind of make sure that these models work well in the production environment. Uh, this data set comprised of not just one, but almost or over 1,300 advertising categories, hourly data, uh, we trained it on a little over a month and then tested it on the, the following week. So with this, um, we tested again the TBATS model and it had a mace of 0.84 and ran in 17 seconds. Um, keep in mind that like all of these metrics were all predicted on the same test set, regardless of what it was trained on. Um, the filter net was trained on that same category and it had slightly better air um, but was trained in a fourth of the time. For us, this is like fantastic. We can get you know, at least on par uh, and improve training speed so we can put more complex stuff in our system. 
Then I wanted to know how well could this model do if we included additional context about what's going on. Maybe it can get some information from other categories and use that information to improve its performance on that same category. So I trained the filter net on those, that full training set. Um, though it took 60 seconds, it outperformed what it did on the single category, showing evidence that it was able to share information from other categories to improve its predictions on a, a single category. Um, this functionality is not, uh, we're not able to do this on the current TBAS model. For every category, we have to train a single TBAS model and have to iterate over and over again. So for us, this is fantastic that we can train not only one model for this whole data set, but it can do so quickly and it improves the performance overall for our predictions. Um, finally, we removed that, uh, the test category that we've been running all these predictions on from the training set, again, as if it's never seen it before, and it had slightly worse but close to the same uh, error rate, which is pretty awesome that we're able to, you know, the sharing is that strong. Uh, finally, I was kind of curious why the, the TBAS and the filter night performed about the same for this data set. And I was kind of digging into like, well, how much training data impacts how well this model performs? So I started reducing the amount of training data each of these models have. And you can see that the TBAS model, uh, after we get down to 21 days, starts to kind of fall off and perform worse. It doesn't have enough data to kind of pick up those seasonal trends, especially at the weekly data if it's only got three weeks. Um, however, the filter net continues to perform really, really well, uh, even with shorter and shorter data sets, which is really encouraging. So in conclusion, uh, we think this model has like a lot of great perks. The performance increase for one is like 7% over the best thing that we're using right now, which is fantastic. The training speed is um, variable depending on what you're trying to do, but anywhere between 10 and 300%. The other thing you can do with these PyTorch models is save out pre-trained ones and further increase the training speed when you're showing it to some new data. Uh, we can also include context, which is fantastic. Ours is heavily laden with context, and we weren't able to do that before. Uh, and it's also less sensitive to the amount of data that you give it. However, you have to keep in mind that the quality of data regarding missing data points is um, a drawback for this. We also did some additional testing between like, how well these, the convolutional side of the model and the context model played together. We found that both of them performed pretty well, but when you combine them, they both were complementary and added an additional benefit and outperformed uh, them running by themselves. Uh, yeah, so thank you guys for uh, listening, and are there any questions? Nathan, did you want to come back up just in case there was any for you? Yeah, hello. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, super interesting. So I had uh, two questions. So uh, one was, um, did you consider uh, doing some more uh, feature engineering? So um, for example, taking like um, the derivative of uh, the time series or, you know, maybe like the data point from one hour ago minus the data point from six hours ago. Do you, do you think it would be help, help to do some feature engineering uh, to, for the input? And then um, the second question is, um, uh, did you learn anything interesting by examining uh, the weights uh, that were the result of the training? So um, for example, you, maybe you learned that um, you know, the, um, the data points from one and two hours ago were like 10 times more important than the, um, than the data points from uh, 10 and 11 hours ago. Did, did you learn anything interesting like that? Yeah, I'll handle the first one and then I'll pass the second one on to Nathan. Uh, so for the first one, we, we tried to keep it somewhat simple as we could, uh, just tr trying to reduce the complexity when we're doing this testing. Um, also to kind of at least give somewhat of a fair com fairer comparison between these two models. So we included just the hour day of week, and then the days of the month, which we kind of assumed that the TBATS model was pulling from those seasonal graphs. Um, so no, that, that would be a good idea, though, and probably something that we should use. 
Yeah, I, I didn't talk about this at all, but my very first attempt was to do some pretty heavy feature engineering, both the differential stuff and um, adding in like aggregation. And what my idea was, and this didn't work very well, was to turn the one-dimensional singles into two-dimensional singles by actually, if you think of a matrix, it's a vector, and then maybe shifting it one or aggregating it one and creating an actual two-dimensional version and putting that into a traditional deep you know, convolutional neural network. Didn't work very well. It's better to explain on the whiteboard if you want later. Um, so we, yeah, so in, in the prototype that we, we, we showed, we didn't do a lot of feature engineering. For the uh, filters, I was very interested in that too. I wanted to see if they looked like something cool, like those cool wavy kinds of filters you see from the, um, the 2D. So these are some actual filters. So again, the filters are vectors and they're plotted um, across here. I mean, you can take away what you want from that, but um, it's interesting, you know, one of these zeros out, the sort of fifth one across, so this is an actual set of learned filters from that network that you saw that performed well. And, um, you know, I don't know if some of these are edge, edge detecting, um, but you can kind of do your own takeaway. That's what they actually look like. Thank you. So what was the data you were using to fit here? It was a, a revenue per click data for an automotive category. Okay. Yeah. And uh, another question I had was, were you uh, predicting like a week's worth of data or just like the next hour and data? Just the next hour. Okay. The way we generally do that, obviously it looked pretty good, right? So the way we generally do any kind of fitting is we try to compare it to, you know, actually what can we do in production? So we're going to do the best, we're going to, you know, do the best thing we can in production. So in production, it's a little more complicated because we usually don't have everything up to the last hour. We have everything up to about four hours ago. So we didn't want to get into that nuance, but we, we compared it against a, a real life situation. And that's, the, so yeah, we used everything up to the, to the last hour and tried to just predict the next hour rolling across. Right. Yeah. All right, thanks. It was very interesting idea that you had that to train these filters and then to uh, to use a deep learning technique combined with it. Uh, I wanted to know, you looked at these LSTMs uh, in the first slide, you mentioned them. Uh, has anybody tried to use them to predict in a, in, in a production environment? The, the other standard techniques? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm sure people have tried them. I, I looked at some of them. Uh, they performed okay. So, you know, they, they would work. I just, I wanted to try something new. I, ha I had a, an itch I wanted to scratch, just, you know, just to see if this stuff would work. Okay. But you're talking about like the long, uh, long short-term memory type models. Yes. Yeah, um, I, I did run some of those and they, they work okay as well. I probably, you know, in my memory, probably not as well as the T-Bats, um, but they, 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 they can work as well. Okay, thanks. Uh, if you're doing uh, multiple time series at once, could you look at that as like an n-dimensional convolutional neural, neural net, like rather than scoping it down to one dimension, it's just, it becomes a picture of many dimensions? Do you want to talk about how you did the multiple categories? Um, I mean, you, you, yeah, we you, could probably you leveraged both, the batch processing. Yeah, we probably could both touch on this, but um, we didn't want there to be like a too much interaction in the, the convolution if you have uh, multiple dimensions in that convolutional filter, you're pulling from things above and below. And we didn't want there to be a whole lot of overlap between, it's kind of like you have to make decisions about what you're wanting to do there. Do you use yesterday's or last week's 24 hour or the, the yesterday's to overlap these things? And those can create different filters in themselves. Um, so sticking with the 1D, like at least eliminated that complexity, that might be a cool avenue to check out and see how that works out. It might do even better. Uh, but we essentially, when we did the whole 1300 categories, we ran it in batch. So it is looking at everything in like a, a matrix, but they're still somewhat separate. Yeah, and I don't know if this also helps answer. It, there probably is a better way to pack some of this into a matrix multiplication. Um, 
and I think the closest we got to that is some, using some of the batch processing uh, with PyTorch. Other questions? Good. Great. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much.